What is up my friends? Thanks so much for clicking on today's video. My name is Kim and if you like true crime like I do, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. I post two times a week and you don't want to miss out. Today's case is about Gregory Green, the man charged with killing his family not once but twice. <laughs> Gregory Green was born on December 10, 1966 in Dearborn Heights, Michigan. Gregory's neighbors described him as the guy who just kind of kept to himself. The neighborhood was considered to be a family-friendly neighborhood, and it wasn't uncommon for a neighbor to just wave and say hi, but Gregory wasn't like that. He never really did wave, and it wasn't uncommon that he wouldn't wave back. But for the most part, he was a hardworking man. He worked at Detroit Metro Airport. Uh, neighbors often seen the household filled with family for them hosting birthday parties or barbecues. Gregory was a very religious man. He would attend church often. He did this from a very young age. There was one time that one of the neighbors got a knock on the door from Gregory. Gregory accidentally backed into his car, and so Gregory walked up to the door, politely knocked and told him what had happened, and so they could work it out. No red flags here, for the most part. Greg would go on to marry his first wife in July of 1989. Her name was Latoya, but she went by Tanya, Tanya Clayton Green. Tanya was also a very religious woman, attending church often as well. She went to the Greater Grace Temple. She was born in Detroit and attended Mumford High School. Tanya had two children when Gregory and her were married. Her friends described her as fun-loving, kind, and a big heart. Tanya and Gregory early on had some troubles in their marriage. Tanya was telling her friends that Gregory had changed. She wasn't sure what was going on with him. She thought maybe he was getting into drugs where he hadn't before, but his personality had changed. She was fed up and was going to leave the relationship. Like she was over it, I can't deal with this. So she told her friend she was going to go to church and when she got home, she was going to pack her clothes and get the hell out of there. She was done with Gregory. Two years of marriage, six months pregnant, Tanya had enough, she was done. But Tanya would never have the chance to leave. Officers arrived on July 14, 1991. Gregory opened the door for the officers and said, she's in the kitchen, I stabbed her. Gregory had killed his six month pregnant wife Tanya and called the police on himself. I know that 911 operator was like, um, you did what? He's a piece of shit. The officer walks into the kitchen and finds Tanya lifeless. Gregory then tells them, I hid the knife under, under the, the fridge. You can find it there. Gregory had stabbed his six month pregnant wife in the face, neck, chest, and back. One child was hiding in a closet, because remember, Tanya had two children. One was hiding in a closet and was unharmed, and then the other one, luckily, was at school. So while they're not physically harmed, emotionally, I'm sure they're scarred for life. So now you may be thinking, Gregory felt bad, and he called the police to turn himself in out of guilt for what he had done. But oh contraire, mon frere, no, no, no. Gregory showed little emotion for his crime. He was stated by the judge to have shown little to no remorse. Gregory Green pleaded no contest to second degree murder, so there was no trial, and Gregory was sentenced to 15 to 25 years in prison for killing Tanya and their unborn child. While in prison, Gregory took advantage of their cognitive-based programs. For the most part, Gregory kept his nose clean. He didn't get in a lot of trouble. So after serving about 16 years in prison for murder, second degree, Greg was released on parole in 2008. 
with the support of family and friends, including a pastor who lobbied on his behalf, Fred Harris, a pastor in Detroit who wrote to the Michigan Parole Board in August of 2005. He says, Gregory and I were friends before his mishap and he was incarcerated. He was a member of our church. I feel he has paid for his unfortunate lack of self-control and the damage he has caused as much as possible and is sorry. Later that year, he would also write again. And if he was released, he would be welcomed as part of their church community and they would do whatever they could to help him adjust. Very good. You know, he has a good support system. People are writing in. He got another letter from a department corrections officer who was pleading for mercy for Green on Green's behalf. He wrote the judge and said, Your Honor, I know that Gregory is not a criminal, nor is he a threat to society. On the contrary, he is a very productive member and a a positive contributor to society. I don't know how this person knew all that, but sounds good. Although Green was denied parole four times, twice in 2004 and twice in 2006, it was stated that it was various reasons. It mostly centered around his lack of remorse for his crime. He had gained inadequate insight and had lacked empathy. But after several letters to the parole board, Gregory was released in 2008 from prison and was off parole by April 2010. This seems like a short period, like when you get out of jail, you're on parole and they check on you and you have to do drug tests or whatever. He was only on that for two years. Seems like five is typical. I don't know. Either way, it doesn't matter. Anyways. A spokesperson from the Michigan Department of Corrections said if he wasn't paroled in 2008, he would have for sure been paroled by 2012. That Green had done well other than just getting in a fist fight in 2002 over a TV, you know, fighting over the TV. He had been a model inmate, like he had no red flags. So not long after Gregory was released from prison, he met Faith Harris. Faith was the daughter of the pastor, Fred, who was writing in, advocating for Gregory to get out of prison. So Fred Harris, Gregory started going to church. He liked Fred, and then by association, uh, here's Faith. And so Faith and Greg hit it off instantly. I really believe that Fred saw the good in Gregory because you have to admit, Gregory is squeaky clean until he's not. He really did uh, keep his nose clean. He didn't have a criminal record other than, you know, this big one. So I think, you know, Fred saw that in him. But don't get me wrong. I hope this guy burns in hell. But we're going to move on. Faith and Gregory fall in love. And they're to marry in 2010. Faith, of course, was a, a large member of the church. She had two children from a previous relationship, one boy, Chadney, and one girl, Kara. And by 2013, the relationship was falling apart. In February 2013, Faith actually was denied a PPO. She was definitely scared, but the judge stated that he had declined it because the request didn't include that he had a past criminal record. When they process PPOs, they don't do like a background check or make sure that, you know, they're not a criminal or whatever. They rely on who's ever filling out the application to include all the information. So ladies and gents, if you ever are in an unfortunate position to have to fill one of these out, please, please, please make sure you fill out that information. But hopefully you never are. So in her complaint, she said, he's trying to make me leave the home. We're filing for divorce. He's being belligerent, kicking things. He kicked the couch while the baby was sleeping on it. He's just kicking things, threatening me and saying, if I don't leave, things are going to get ugly. He jumped at me like he was going to attack me. And this went on for hours. <laughs> Look, if an ex-murderer tells me to leave or he's, it's going to get ugly, I'm exiting the chat. See you later. Bye-bye. 
but then I have to think about this. Faith and her four children, that's five people. I mean, you can't just go sleep on somebody's couch. Like, they have school in the morning. It's not, it's not an easy task just to leave the house. But he was one. Why didn't he leave? Why didn't he get the F out? Why is he kicking her out? I don't know, I can't understand people sometimes. October 2003, she moved all of her children out and she moved out herself and she filed for a divorce. Faith was done. She was gone for almost a year. Unfortunately, she returned. I'm sure Gregory had promised her the moon and that everything was going to be different. Um, and because the divorce just kind of sat there, it was thrown out because there was no activity on it. But by August 2016, things were right back to the way they were in 2013. And Faith filed for divorce again and was going to leave Gregory, but not before Gregory would impose the worst horror I've heard in a long time. And I am not new to peeking into true crime. In this case, is horrible, horrible. If you are sensitive, then this is the time to click off this video. It is absolutely horrible. Early in the morning on September 21st, 2016, one month after Faith filed for divorce, Faith Harris Green was bound with duct tape and zip ties in her basement of their home. Gregory had shot her in her foot and cut her face with a box cutter from her mouth to her ear. He kept her alive in the basement for his next victims, their four children. Gregory had put the youngest two children, his biological children, in his Toyota car that he backed into the driveway. He duct tape a hose piping into the from the car's exhaust into the car window. He let all of the exhaust into the car with his children sleeping in it and poisoned them with carbon dioxide. One being Coy, who was six years old. She was a first grader at St. Sebastian Catholic School. She loved school and all of her teachers and was learning Spanish. She was a cheerleader, a ballerina. Coy loved pizza and dress up. The other being Kaylee, who is only four years old. Kaylee was a preschooler also at St. Beth, St. Sebastian School. Her favorite things were singing, cheerleading, and ballet dancing. She loved eating macaroni and cheese and playing outside. Completely heartbroken. Oh my God, this is devastating. It, it literally breaks my heart. He planned this one week in advance. He shopped at Home Depot for the supplies to do this. He didn't snap. When I initially heard this, I thought, oh my gosh, he must have snapped. Oh no, he didn't snap, he planned. After the girls had passed away, he carried them one by one up to their beds, and that's where the police would find them, is tucked into their beds. And I really wish this story was over right here. I wish this was the end, but Gregory then took his stepchildren, Kara and Chadney, to the basement by gunpoint. There he forced Chadney to tie his sister's wrists with zip ties and duct tape. Afterward, Gregory bound Chadney to the way his sister was bound and put them on the floor together. And then Gregory would go on to shoot both teens in front of their mother he wanted her to see his destruction. He shot both teens multiple times. The worst case scenario happened for that mother that day. One being Kara, who was 17 years old. She was an honor student. She had a promising future at the new Southland High School for Arts and Technology. She was a varsity cheerleader, a staff writer for the school newspaper, a member of the National Honor Society. Kara was taking honors and advanced placement classes in preparation for college. She dreamed of attending Salem College in North Carolina. 
and becoming an OBGYN. The brother was 19 years old. His name was Chadney Allen. He graduated in 2015 from Southfield High School. He enjoyed art and excelled in the program that allowed him to have his work exhibited at the GM building in downtown Detroit. He received a digital media art certificate from Spex Howard. Chadney worked part-time at KFC, enjoyed anime, paintball, video games, and making short movies in his spare time. Faith's life was spared that day, but she will replay these events in her head until the day she dies. I'm sure she has moments when she wishes she wasn't spared that day just from the grief alone. Gregory left Faith Bound in the basement and just after 1 a.m. in the morning on September 21st, 2016, he once again called 911 to come and get him because he had once again killed his family. The police show up and Gregory is sitting on the porch and told the police his wife was alive downstairs with her two kids that I shot, and the other two kids are in their beds. An unspeakable tragedy unfolding tonight in Dearborn Heights. Radio, there's one that's shot. There's two that are breathing. One appears to be alive. Four children hold the prime suspect, a man they knew very well. Good to have you with us tonight for Local 4 News at 5. We've got several new developments to report at this hour in this horrible crime in Dearborn Heights. Oh, it really is. Let's get you caught up with what we know right now. Four children, ages 4, 5, 17, and 19, all found murdered inside a home on Hip Street overnight. Police believe the killer was father to two, stepfather to the others. When they arrived on the scene, he was sitting on the porch, ready to turn himself in. No, we are not. That's the mother of those children. She was wounded in the attack. She is said to be right now in fair condition. Things started with our Rod Maloney. Rod, you are at the scene of this horrible crime where a makeshift memorial is slowly growing. That is, it's, uh, it's going up behind me, Carmen. And I must say that over the past couple of years, there have been notable and terrible murders in Metro Detroit, but few compare to the cold-blooded nature of this one. Four children murdered in cold blood inside their home. You take a look over in the gazebo there, you can see some sheets hanging and some lettering. That says happy birthday because there was a party here just a couple of days ago for one of the children. As soon as school let out, the neighborhood children started showing up with teddy bears, creating a front step memorial. The reason? This family is no more. Faith Green, on the left here had four children, two, four-year-old Kaylee and five-year-old Coy with her current husband. They died inside this car pulled into the driveway, rigged up with a hose for exhaust fumes to feed inside. We're told by police after the children died, their bodies returned to their beds, allegedly by their father. The other two children, 17-year-old Kara and 19-year-old Chadney Allen, were Faith's children with another man. Police found their bodies bound in pools of blood, shot execution style. The family lived together in this hip street home for the past nine months. But neighbors say divorce papers arrived yesterday. You can tell these kids were loved. They had a birthday party, there was a trampoline, there was a pool. Just remnants of happy times just left abandoned and empty. Faith was rushed to the hospital. She was treated for wounds to her foot and her face that she got from the box cutter. When Gregory went to his first bond hearing, he stated he didn't need bond. Although I'm sure the judge was thinking, good, because you're not getting it anyways, but he was just making a point that, don't even bother, I don't even need it, but whatever. So the preliminary examination was scheduled from there. So Gregory decided just to plead guilty. He didn't want a trial or anything. He did that the last time, and that's why we don't have a ton of information about Gregory, his family, his upbringing. There's no trial to be seen anywhere. He just pleads guilty, and so he did that in this case too. So he pled guilty to second degree murder. We're just going to go ahead and skip over to sentencing. Uh, that's all the information that's out there. Here is Faith's uh, statement first in, in her words that she had to say to the court. 
I'm not happy. I'm not satisfied with the outcome. There's no punishment that fits the crime. Not even torture and death would be justice. Your justice will come when you burn in hell for all eternity, for murdering four innocent children, all because you're insecure as a man. Plus the other two lives you took. You are a con artist, you are a monster, you are a devil in disguise. You are now forever exposed. I've thought over and over again what I would say, even though it doesn't even matter. First of all, I am not and did not and will not suffer like you intended for me to do. What you tried, what you tried to do didn't work. I am and was a damn great mother to all of my children. I was their mother and father. I'm the one who took out the time with each and, each and every one of them. I carried each one of them in my womb for nine months and raised them. Nothing or no one, sure as hell, not you, can break me or break my bond with them. But while I stand up here trembling with fear, I put on my bravest face to be in the same room with the man who murdered all four of my children. Two of them violently in front of me with the gun, Chadney and Kara. And he killed the other two babies, Coy and Kaylee, with a hose that ran from the tailpipe of his car to where they were innocently sleeping. As if that wasn't enough, let me tell you about some of the devastation that it has actually done to me and my family. My short-term memory is gone. Doctors tell me it's my brain protecting me from the memories of my children being shot in their heads right in front of me while I was gagged, duct taped, and zip tied. Every time I find strength to get out of bed, as soon as I walk, I'm in extreme pain, sharp pain, from where he shot me in my foot. They don't know if I'll ever walk again without pain. Think about that for a second. Never being able to again to walk without pain. My doctors say I have post-traumatic stress disorder. That's where the migraines and nightmares come from. Sometimes I dream of the night all this happened and wake up screaming and sweating, thinking that I can save my children somehow. Then I realize that the nightmare is actually reality and my children are really gone and I try to find the strength to start my day somehow. Other times there's just crazy nightmares that I wake up from in fear and try to understand them, but I'm told that they all link back to this horrific experience I have had. A part of me will always be missing. If the day ever comes when I do wake up and it's not the first thing that I think about, when I look in the mirror I will always be reminded by the scars he put on my face, cut me from my ears to my chin with a razor blade box cutter. The pain on the left side of my face never goes away. He cut me so deep that it severed multiple nerves that may never heal correctly. I lost so much blood. I was in critical condition for days. I should have died. Some days I wish I would have. He has scarred me for life. My whole family is devastated emotionally by what has happened. But it has extremely been hard on my parents. They love their grandchildren with all their hearts. Most days, my mother has a hard time getting out of bed and has been in the hospital a few times, but my father is taking it the hardest. <coughs> He's not the same person he once was. The stress has taken a toll on his health. Two weeks ago, he was taken to the hospital because he had a stroke. I honestly don't know where to go from here. I'm numb. I love the part when she said, you tried to break me, but it didn't work. She has been put through hell and back. She got through it strong and I find her extremely brave. My favorite part though is when she said, all because you are an insecure man. I couldn't have said it better. I felt that Faith was very poised. She was very well spoken. A lot of these sentencing hearings, the statements that the families give, they scream and they yell and they're angry and I understand it completely. But she was very poised. She wanted to say what she wanted to say and she she said what she needed to say. I, I really enjoyed her statement, although it was, I was crying. Like it literally broke my heart. That poor woman. There's just not words that you could say. It's, it's just, it's just, it's something of a horror movie. It's just awful. Let's talk about Gregory's statement, his final statement to the court before his sentencing, his plea. The facts of this case um, indicate that Mr. Green prepared for these murders. He shopped at a Home Depot a week before. He bought piping so that he could um, 
alter the exhaust system of the car where the two youngest children were ultimately asphyxiated. Um, he knew what he was going to do, he planned it, and I think by nature of that alone, 15 points should be scored for predatory conduct. Additionally, we have the domestic relationship with Faith Green. She is also a victim in this case. Thank you. Mr. Green, is that time and date separate sentencing? Is there anything you'd like to say on your own behalf, sir? Um, I just want to say, well, first of all, congrats on you know, he can judge. Um, I don't, you know, I do regret and I'm sorry for what has happened. You know, all I've ever wanted was a um, God-fearing, helping a helpmate that would support me and be faithful no matter what, as well as dedicate to the whole family. You know, I, you know, that put aside, I, you know, I have to be humble, very humble, because God knows the heart, and He knows how regretful, how sorry I am, and even now. After all this, he still has a plan. And I'm not giving that up, giving up on that plan. Because God, God is God. You know, and there's not one day that I go by that I don't think of my girls. Not one day, often, picturing them playing and talking to their Heavenly Father. And, you know, you know, I pray that God be with Chad and Karen. Um, you know, it, 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 I feel I feel bad for how this has deeply impact, impacted everyone, and um, may God help them, help me, help us all. That's all I have to say. Okay, Mr. Green, of all the tragic cases this court has seen, the fact of this one are by far, by far the worst. Fathers are supposed to protect their children. Yes. Husbands are supposed to protect their wives. Amen. I didn't know how I would sit here this morning and get through listening to Miss Green testify about what happened in this case. Yet I look at you when you appear utterly unmoved yes. by everything that she said. He does not seem to care. Is it just me? Do you guys see any emotion on this guy? Is there a tear to be seen anywhere, anywhere? You got any? No. And there was a part, I'm going to replay it, where he's annoyed by, they say domestic violence to faith or something like that. He literally rolled his eyes. I'm going to play that clip for you. She is also a victim in this case. It's like, bro, you can't even fake it. Jeez. She is also a victim in this case. Then I also think he was sending her a message when he said God had a plan for me and God still has a plan and he like leans over. I'll play that again too. Even now, after all this, he still has a plan. And I'm not giving that up, I'm giving up on that plan. Is that all about? Does he really think nothing's wrong and that he'll just be forgiven? For me, I'm just happy that he's in prison for the rest of his life. What happens from there, let it be. But for now, he cannot hurt anybody else. On March 1st, 2017, Gregory Green, for charges that included four counts of first degree murder, one count of unlawful imprisonment, torture, assault, felon with the possession of a firearm, Gregory was sentenced to 47 to 102 years in prison. He won't be eligible for parole until he's 97 years old. I don't think we have to worry about him getting out again. I don't understand why they didn't give him life, but they didn't want to fight the plea deal because that means they would have to go to trial. And they didn't want to put the family through any more than what they've already been through. He'll be 97, he'll be denied for parole, I, you know, we move on. My heart goes out to this family. I wish them nothing but love and heartfelt wishes their way. This case was tough. This is, this is so difficult to understand his motive. He just wanted to cause faith, pure pain, more pain 
than you could ever imagine. I was so angry that he was let out of prison after 16 years, according to the Michigan Department of Corrections, okay? The average sentence for a second degree murder is 26 years. I mean, some get as low as five years, some get life, but for the most part, the average is 26 years. How did he get out after 16 years? And, you know, he ple he pled for the second degree. As far as the parole, he checked all the boxes. Like, he was a model inmate. He was a good parolee. So it wasn't that. What I think it is, is we need to back up just a little bit further. So his first crime was killing his pregnant wife, right? He got 16 to 25 years for that? Like... In what world? That's first degree. He called the cops on himself. He admitted he did it. He got second degree in only 15 to 25 years? Why? I, I don't understand that. Like, it should have been longer. I don't know what happened there of why his sentence was so short. His parole shouldn't have been as early as it, in my opinion. I wasn't there. I don't know. I just think he got too good of a sweet deal and maybe just maybe this could have been prevented it's hard to say it's really hard to say he may have got out and did it again i don't know he could have got out 10 years later and still did it you just don't know that's what our justice justice system is there for is to protect us and in this case he did the crime but i don't feel like he did the time in my opinion. I don't know. You guys tell me what you think below. Am I way off base here? I mean, if you take out the incidents in the future, because hindsight is twenty twenty. you know, like we now know he was dangerous and that happened. But even if that didn't happen, should he have only got 15 to 25 years? I don't know. And I'm also glad that he's not put on death row. Like he would have never been put on death row. I like that he's sitting in jail and he has to think about what he did. I know he has little remorse. I don't know him, but I've heard like the judges and prosecutors say that he has little remorse. But if he has a shred in him, just a feeling, I hope he feels all of them in the worst way possible. Because mind you, not only did he kill his stepkids, he killed his own kids. So death would be too easy in this case, I feel. I have to say that this man literally freaks me out from the point that he killed his wife and baby and got out to live like a normal life. Like when it comes to people like, let's just say like Pazuzu or whoever his name is, or Charles Manson, okay, maybe that's a better example. Like they wear their crazy out in the open. Like you know where they're coming from and you kind of know to stay away from that type of person, right? But like a person like this or a Gary Ridgeway who just plays this everyday nice guy, goes to work, those guys freak me out. Like just beware my loves if if there's some kind of red flag then just run people are scary <laughs> like i said this case it has been one of the toughest cases i have ever done i will not be doing children cases anytime soon i didn't realize how tough these cases are it's one thing to watch them on you know a, another channel and kind of breeze through them but when i'm actually digesting the information and doing research and looking at these people and you kind of get invested it's not healthy like i i've been upset i've cried i've it has not been healthy for me i'm glad that i am able to get this message out but i won't be doing a child case not anytime soon not a case like this it is the worst case i have ever heard and and i've you know there's been serial killers on my channel and i still it's this one that really touched me is because it was children and so now i know my limits i gotta take care of myself 
and I just won't be doing this type of video anytime soon. Thanks so much for watching, you guys. If you made it this far, you might as well go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Love you guys to death. I'll see you in my next one. Bye.